I'm glad to have you here and I'm glad to have a fantastic panel of speakers to have uh, some discussions today about uh, uh, patient um, rights, opt-in, opt-out, the European data space uh, and uh, England's uh, national data opt-out. So um, I would like to briefly welcome you and uh, explain a little bit what are the ideas behind the panel and how we, th we thought of discussing today uh, the aspects of uh, this panel. And uh, so we started thinking of discussing health data and the, how patients can uh, determine themselves with also the new regulations. Um, because as you may know, the European data space is being discussed uh, uh, at the moment. And more broadly, health data has become a focal point of discussions, especially and also for data infrastructure and governance. And there have been large scale initiatives uh, in UK and EU where um, there, there are initiatives that allow individuals to share their data uh, with those regulations. And in 2018, there was the England's national opt-out that will be presented later on that was set to allow patients to opt out and uh, for their information to be used to research and planning. And the European data space proposal has, um, has provides data portability and is promising also some uh, discussions about patient data and control. So the idea behind the panel was to discuss these aspects currently uh, at the policy level, having regard also what happened in, uh, in England. And um, the objective, therefore, is to try to advance and see what happened, what, are, what were the aspects at stake, uh, what could, be, uh, could nurture the debate for the European data space, and how patients as well have uh, control uh, on their data. So today, um, we have, uh, as uh, uh, anticipated, a fantastic uh, panel of, uh, of speaker, uh, speakers. And um, just to communicate, there has been a slight change in the composition of the panel as a speaker uh, couldn't join us, Elisa Leila El Hajj. Um, we will join today's, uh, today Teodora Lalova Spinks uh, to talk about and introduce us to um, the European Health Data Space. She is a researcher at the Keulöwen Center for IP and IT Law. Um, and also researched at the phar um, clinical pharmacological and pharmacotherapy at uh, KU Leuven. Her research focuses on uh, clinical research, data protection, patient empowerment, and um, uh, she will be the first speaker uh, of, this, of this panel. Uh, I will introduce later on the other panels. Ideally, what we want to do is to have an initial set of discussions. Every uh, presenter will have a 10 minutes presentation to set a little bit uh, the discussion. Uh, after every presentation, if you wish to ask a couple of questions, and then we have a lot of, uh, also some question uh, slots after those presentations. So. Uh, we want to have as much as possible interaction during this talk. Um, so yes, without further ado, um, I would like to give the floor now to Teodora Lalova Spinks. And thank you very much for being here. You have the floor. Ah, you, you might. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you very much, Elisabetta. Uh, and thank you very much for the opportunity to join you today and to discuss together. So uh, as shared by Elisabetta, I will be presenting a very brief introduction into the structure of the European Health Data Space Regulation. Uh, and I'll be using um, as a guidance the proposal as uh, suggested by the European Commission. So this is the version uh, from May 2022. But I will also incorporate a little bit of the discussions already ongoing uh, at the level of the European Parliament and the European Council. Let's see if it works. It works, great. <laughs> Maybe I'm gonna stand up so that I can also see what I'm, I'm discussing with you. Let's go up, I go like this. 
So what is in a name? What is the European health data space? Uh, important to keep in mind is that based on the European strategy for data, the idea is to create uh, data spaces in 10 strategic fields, including agriculture, media, and so on. And actually the health data space is the first such data space, in a way the blueprint for everything to come afterwards. So in that regard, it's also quite important. The objectives as presented on the slides, the very first one is to provide increased control of natural persons over their electronic health data. Under this concept of electronic health data, also very interesting to keep in mind is that it encompasses both personal and non-personal data. Another objective is to provide a legal framework that consists of trusted governance mechanisms and secure processing environments that will come later in the slides when it comes to sharing and having access to health data across the Union. And finally, to contribute to a genuine single market for digital health products and services. What is also important to keep in mind is that the health data space is building upon the already uh, quite complex um, and divergent uh, legal framework for health research and data use in the, in the scope of health research and healthcare. So, of course, we have the General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR, but also here it needs to be mentioned the Data Governance Act that entered into force uh, uh, last year already and provides the horizontal framework for the data spaces. The Data Act, the AI Act, uh, Medical Device Regulation, Clinical Trials Regulation, uh, Cross-Border Healthcare um, Services Directive, and so on. So it's adding to an already quite interesting uh, landscape of interplaying acts. The main structure that I'm going to present today of the uh, Commission proposal of the health data space, and this will continue most probably after the, the discussions as well at the level of the institutions, is that the health data space regulation speaks about two types of use and provides rules about two types of use of health data, primary and secondary use. What is meant by primary use? This is all the processing of personal electronic health data in the scope of providing health care health services. And here the most important from the patient point of view and related to this objective of strengthened individual control is the enhanced data subject rights. As you know, under the GDPR, we have a toolbox of data subject rights. The health data space strengthens them. For instance, we have, um, I'm gonna show here on the next slide, enhanced rights to access to data, which will help also with seeking diagnosis and treatment abroad cross borders, an enhanced right to rectification, enhanced data portability rights, uh, rights to restrict access of health professionals to the, to the files of patients, um, and also rights to obtain information on the healthcare professionals who have already taken a look at our files. And important in the scope of cross-border healthcare, the idea is to create a common European electronic health record exchange format. Very brief um, example of how ex what exactly we mean by enhanced data subject rights. I'm using here the example of the data portability rights. Uh, under the GDPR, the data, with the data portability rights, we have the right to request the transfer of our data in a digital format from, from one controller to another. It originated in the telecom services and it is limited. It applies only to data that we ourselves have provided. So, for instance, inferred data is not in its scope, and this is very important for healthcare because inferred data would be diagnosis, for instance, or results of blood tests, other types of tests. Also, it doesn't apply to non-personal data, and it applies only when our data was processed on two valid legal bases under the GDPR, either consent or contract. With the health data space, at least in the Commission proposal, this is going to be enhanced meaning that now we, we're going to be able to rely on the data portability, also for inferred data pertaining to us, so diagnosis, test results, and so on. And irrespective of the legal basis on which the data was processed, could be public interest, legitimate interest, vital interest of the data subject, and so on. The other big um, block of rules, very important, and especially today for today's panel, is the rules on secondary use in Chapter 4 of the proposal. Secondary use of electronic health data encompasses everything in terms of scientific research, 
training, uh, education, public interest, public health, and so on. And also very important uh, in, in the sense of the interplay with the Data Governance Act, which introduced the idea of data altruism, it provides some rules on data altruism as well. So under this uh, structure of the secondary uh, use rules, very important to keep in mind is that there are minimum categories of data that should be made available for such access and use. These minimum categories include uh, most notably the electronic health records, but also, for instance, uh, I'm not going to go through the full list, but let's say a research service, data from clinical trials, data from biobanks, as well as possible. And important also to keep in mind, there are also prohibited uses. So for this type of uses, the data cannot be used. The electronic health data is not going to be available. This is prohibited. And quite logical, uh, it includes, for instance, uh, when, whenever there is taking decisions that could be detrimental to the individual whose data is being processed, uh, or for instance, developing products or services that are detrimental to individuals and society as a whole, like tobacco, alcohol, uh, drugs, and so on. Also very uh, interesting and important to keep in mind is that under this secondary use uh, framework, there are new roles and new responsibilities uh, being designed and going to be established at the level of the EU. First of all, the health data access body. The idea is to have such bodies established in each of the European member states, and they will be responsible one, the responsible ones to provide access to electronic health data. We also have the figures of the data user and the data uh, holder. Uh, both the data user and the data holder, this could be individuals or legal entities, like pharmaceutical companies, hospitals, biobanks, uh, and so on. And the data holders would be obliged to provide, to populate a catalog of all the data that they are processing. Uh, on the other side, data users would be able to apply with a data request or a data application to the health access body and request access to specific types of data that they need. If they have responded to all of the conditions under the health data space, the health data access body would issue a data permit giving access to such data and request the data from the data holder and then provide it through a secure processing environment. The very important to keep in mind is that the data should be in principle provided anonymized, so non-personal data, unless due to the types of, let's say, activity, research, uh, it is impossible to do, to, to do the processing uh, in a good way with anonymized data, and then at least pseudonymized data should be provided. This is very important in the scope of health research, uh, when, where oftentimes anonymized data is not enough or not sufficient uh, for good research, good conclusions. And here, just a couple of words about the patient side. So what could be the opportunities and also the risks when it comes to the health data space uh, proposal and regulation? I'm using here the two concepts of, on the one side, patient empowerment and data control. Patient empowerment is a concept in care and research uh, quite broad, already having been discussed and seen an increase into the discussions about it since the 70s. And the idea is to, uh, it aims to more broadly provide and identify the patient's needs um, and preferences, both in healthcare and research, and to meet them, to find tools to meet them. Uh, intertwined with it is the central notion of data control, central to data protection and also part of the GDPR with Recital 7. And this is very important because with this objective of increased control of individuals over their data of the health data space, we are right in the discussion of patient empowerment as well. So the health data space could be seen, could be said to uh, pr promise a strengthened individual control or over electronic health data. And this is very, very visible on the, within the rules on primary use of data. So all of this list of enhanced data subject rights that I presented to you. But there is some uh, discussion points uh, and question marks when it comes to patient empowerment and data control in the secondary use of data pertaining to research. So, for instance, the rules on the strengthened data subject rights, like this enhanced data portability, this is not clear in the original proposal uh, from May 2022 whether it applies to secondary use. Depending on the reading of various scholars, it doesn't. The, the strengthened data subject rights do not apply when it comes to secondary uh, use. 
Uh, very interestingly as well, uh, at least in this original proposal, there was a very broad exemption, transparency exemption, for the health data access bodies when it comes to providing individual level information uh, to, to patients, to citizens, whose data is being used through this system. And this was uh, also taken aboard and discussed and criticized on the level of the reports by the European Parliament. We also have, of course, the debate that will be very much the discussion today as well within the panel on what is the best legal basis on which to process data. In the original uh, proposal of the Commission, uh, the legal basis was a legal obligation or a combination of public interest and legitimate interest under the GDPR. After the discussions from the European Parliament, it emerged the debate about an opt-out or also potentially consent. So all of this I'm not going to discuss now, looking forward to the discussions from the other participants. And also interesting to keep in mind, what about broader forms of patient empowerment? We can speak of patient empowerment as data control individually, but there is also patient empowerment in the sense of involving representatives of patients in the decision-making processes about the use of their data. For instance, there is a provision that in the health data access bodies, there should be stakeholder representatives, including patients. And something to, to keep in mind based on, on this introduction for the broader discussion, based on all of these opportunities and risk that is bringing to the patient and keeping in mind that data protection is not an absolute right, it's all, it always a balancing between the individual and the society interests. Very interesting would be to, to see also outside of the, um, also the, the end of the legislative process, how will the health data space reconcile indeed the individual rights with the society, public interest towards research uh, and healthcare? Thank you very much. Looking forward to the presentations. Thank you very much, Theodora, for, for your presentation. Um, Theodora really helped us uh, um, having an introduction on what is the European health data space, what does it mean for for patients and the possible uh, discussions about control over personal data and uh, also introducing a little bit uh, uh, the legal basis and the issue of opt-in and opt-out. And one of the things that we wanted to discuss today was, okay, we have the European data space, uh, what are the points that uh, we want to discuss, what are the critical aspects, what to expect, is it, is it is it going to happen for real or what? Um, and we thought while composing the panel to have different, uh, different parts and expertise. Uh, Teodora is uh, uh, from academia. And then uh, we have uh, also the participation of uh, uh, civil society. Uh, Nicola Hamilton, he is the head of Understanding Patient Data, which is an initiative at making the use of health data uh, more visible, transparent and trustworthy. And this is initiative is based in the UK. Uh, her background is also in UK civil services and most recently uh, working on health data policies and projects. And today, since European health data space is also about discussing opt-in and opt-out for patients, we thought, let's see what happened in other experiences of implementation of these policies. So, Nicola will uh, uh, now uh, bring to us the example of the England's national NHS opt-out. Thank you very much, Nicola. Thank you. Uh, I'll stay sat down because I'm quite comfortable now. So uh, you just have to put up with me occasionally looking at the screen. Um, oh. I mean, I know you guys are still angry about Brexit, but seriously. <laughs> okay, there we go. Uh, so I thought, first of all, it'd be helpful to give a little bit of context about um, the opt-out situation in the UK. And it's actually different across each nation in the UK because health policy has devolved, um, which means Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, England can all make their own policy about health. health. And even though the data protection policy is UK-wide, um, because health policy isn't, it means that we sometimes end up with different health data policies across the UK. Um, so just looking at the map quickly, 
In Scotland, there's no national data opt-out policy, um, and they have got a platform that they've been developing for um, using and analysing health data. In Wales, they haven't got a national opt-out policy either, um, and they've also got um, a platform. In Northern Ireland, they currently don't have a national data opt-out policy, but they are in the process of developing a regional-based one, um, which is quite different. And then in England, we've got quite a few different opt-outs going on. We have a primary care opt-out, so that's at your local doctor level. Um, so you can opt out of your data being shared beyond your general practice. We have a national data opt-out policy, which means once the data gets to our national NHS systems, uh, you have a choice about whether that data is used for planning and research. Um, and then we also have, which aren't on the screen because it's actually hard to find all of them because there's not one nice website that lists what all of them are, um, but lots of other opt-outs for, for example, shared care records um, and lots of different projects and surveys and things that go on in our health service. So it's quite a confusing landscape. Um, also worth mentioning in England at the moment, we have a data for research and development programme, which is setting up a series of secure data environments across England, um, which will be the predominant way for accessing health data for research going forward, rather than uh, sending data out to organisations. And we also have um, a new system coming in, which is called the Federated Data Platform, which is for the NHS to manage its own data um, across England for direct care and for uh, kind of planning and improving services. So having a look at the national data opt-out in England, um, the way that it's done, you can go on the website and you get this quite simple question, uh, which says your confidential patient information can be used for improving health care and services, including planning to improve health and care services, research to find a cure for serious illnesses, and it won't affect your direct care, your individual care, would you like to opt out? Um, and you just click yes or no. And you can go back into the system and change your mind at a later date. You can ring up, you can write to them, um, and so there are various ways of doing it. Um, we also have a publicly available dashboard, which uh, updates very frequently with how many opt-outs we're seeing. And it's quite a useful way of looking at whether there's public support for kind of use of health data at the moment or not. Um, the really big spike that you can see here, uh, which isn't actually that big in the grand scheme of things, but like percentage point change-wise, it's quite significant, uh, was when a programme was introduced a, couple, a few years ago now, um, which is called the General Practice... Uh, GPDPR, General Practice Data for Planning and Research, uh, which was a program that aimed to bring all of the primary care data, so from the GP level, into a central repository so that it can be used for research. We don't have a system like that um, at the moment. We have lots of smaller um, platforms provided by academia or private industry um, that contain maybe like percentages of GP data, but there's nothing that does it as a whole. There was quite a lot of backlash to this project. A lot of healthcare professionals um, weren't supportive of it. A lot of patients weren't supportive of it. A lot of campaigners weren't supportive of it. Um, and there are multiple reasons why it probably wasn't very successful with communication and support of general practice being, being quite significant ones. Um, we then didn't really have many opt-outs until December this year when there were a few, but definitely not as much as we were expecting. This was when the supplier of the Federated Data Platform was announced, which is Palantir, um, obviously a big private uh, technology company that I'm sure many of you know. Um, I think we were expecting the opt-out rate here to be a lot bigger than it was, um, but the, the, the way that the opt-out works means that it doesn't actually affect um, this platform as much as, as much as people thought it was going to. Um, within our data dashboard, we can also drill down into this, the data on who is opting out at a very high level, um, uh, in a very high level way. So we know that generally, 
Um, most opt-outs are coming from the 30 to 39 year old group. Um, the lowest rates of opt-outs are in the more deprived areas of the country. Um, a higher percentage of females opt out compared to males. And there are more opt-outs proportionally in the south of the country. Um, we don't really have the data on how all of that lines up and like what exact, I guess, personas we're missing from the data necessarily, but um, those are just the high level kind of trends that we see. Um, so researchers can take this into account when they're using data from the NHS, um, which helps with some of the representativeness or maybe, you know, um, adjusting for these differences, but it won't always be completely accurate. Um, so I guess the impacts of having this opt-out means that there is a bit of patient choice or members of the public can choose what they want to happen with their data. Um, as we know, opt-out systems tend to be quite successful from a government perspective because more people tend to stay opted in than opt-out, um, which means that in, in our case, more data can be used for research and planning purposes, um, and it's generally quite representative. Um, However, having one question on opt-outs can make things quite difficult because if people are unhappy with something that's been done in the health data space, um, they can opt-out even, even if what's happened doesn't really affect the opt-out. So in the case of the Federated Data Platform, for example, um, we saw some opt-outs. It doesn't actually affect whether your data goes in the system or not, but people may see it as a bit of a protest or a sign that they want to express they're unhappy. So does our opt-out actually do what people expect it to do? I'm not sure. Um, do many people know about the opt-outs in England? Not really. There's been lots of surveys that suggest people don't know it exists, or they thought that the automatic setting is that they are opted out and they would expect to opt in, um, or they think they've opted out of something that you can't actually opt out of at the moment. Um, yeah, when we have some bad decisions or uh, projects in health data that people don't accept, um, we see bits, we see opt-outs, and then the research community, for example, gets very worried that it's going to start affecting research more, and we don't have a good sense of how many opt-outs will actually affect our our research uh, ecosystem. And no one ever wants to put a number on it because if you do put a number on it, it can become a bit of a target. So it'd be like, let's get to 10% of the population opting out because then the government has to change its mind on something. But equally, it means that every time this happens, we don't really know when it's gonna get problematic and when anyone's going to change the policy or remove the opt out, for example, if that's the route that they decided to go down. Um, we also do have an exceptions process. So there's a group uh, called the Confidentiality Advisory Group. Um, it's made up of experts in kind of health, technology, law, ethics, and there are uh, members of the public that are part of that panel as well. Um, if researchers or within the NHS researchers uh, want to do a particular piece of work where they believe they need identifiable data and they believe that the impact of the research would be severely limited by the fact that the opt-outs have been applied. They can put a proposal together to this group um, who then advise on whether they think it's acceptable or not. And the Secretary of State for Health makes the ultimate decision to say, yes, I think that's okay or not. And usually the Secretary of State will go with um, the advice that's been given. However, in recent years, we've seen that exceptions process being used more and more. Um, Obviously, COVID was a bit of a different situation where there were changes to legal powers, um, but even some, some activities within the NHS, for example, looking at population health or auditing services receive exemptions a lot. So again, it's kind of watering down that choice that we're giving people if actually there's so many exceptions that it becomes hard to know which things are actually uh, respecting the opt-out. So a few um, thoughts on why this is relevant to the European health data space. I know that some colleagues of mine have been looking at the opt-outs in England and how that might be applied in the, in the European health data space. And I suppose I wanted to offer some uh, reflections and 
um, n note that our system isn't always isn't the best one necessarily. Um, as kind of you were saying earlier, um, there's a line between kind of public interest and autonomy and privacy, and it's hard to figure out where that is very often, particularly when it comes to health, I think, because it's a very private um, matter, but also it has huge potential for society if we're looking at eradicating diseases and identifying new treatments. Um, sometimes I think governments have a tendency to ask these questions at one point and then expect that, that decision to last a really long time. And actually, we know that public attitudes kind of change. Um, they can be quite flexible depending on decisions that have been taken or what, um, how people feel about the wider government, uh, things that are going on in other data protection uh, areas. Um, and so public support isn't uh, stable necessarily. Um, noting that the UK has different systems. We, we don't really bring our health data to, to, together as a UK country. It's split into four nations. Um, there was a recent study that was published a couple of weeks ago relating to COVID that did take UK data, but I believe it had to be done kind of separately and then brought together rather than looking at all of the data as a whole. I know there are lots of researchers in the public sector and private sector that would prefer the UK data, health data to all be together and, and it provide a much richer uh, data set with obviously a lot more people um, but we're not there yet and that's I think quite an interesting parallel for the EU in terms of if the member states all have different policies about the opt-outs how do you get those benefits of a big um, population or does it cause uh, quite a lot of divergence and difficulty in bringing, bringing it together. Um, one other factor that we've been talking about in the UK quite a lot is around uh, de-identification, privacy enhancing technologies, um, and so our secure data environments that are being developed, um, there's a whole contract that's just related to privacy enhancing technologies and trying to introduce those so that people are less identifiable in the data. But I wonder if it's a question of whether people are genuinely worried about identifiability or whether they are more worried about the ethics of their data being used, even if they can't be identified from it. And how does that balance work? Um, and is it more a case of trust in the people, the organisations, the processes? Uh, that's a bigger factor. And uh, finally, kind of public engagement. So the UK is about to do a large scale public engagement on the use of health data. Um, one of the topics that it might consider is opt-outs, um, but I'd be interested to hear more about how the EU and how the member states are planning to do their public engagement in this space as well. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, insightful presentation of what's, uh, what has happened in UK and how the implementation has gone. Um, continuing our discussion, of course, if you have a, a couple of questions on, on the presentation, please do not hesitate uh, if in between uh, panel presentation to ask. As we are at the privacy camp, uh, we, we want to keep the discussion ongoing. Of course, there is time later on as well. Um, Continuing our discussion, um, we had the academic, uh, more theoretical perspective, we had the civil society aspect brought on today. And the last part of uh, the presentation was also referring to some technical aspects. So one soul that we wanted to also discuss today was from a technical perspective. <laughs> How does it work? So, opt out, uh, how did it work uh, in England, how are the expectations of uh, individual towards those technologies and how patients usually uh, could um, manage those uh, towards, uh, not patient, but in general, how could technology eventually um, facilitate control. Um, and therefore, the next presentation will have a technical um, technical. Uh, um, orientation and it's the time to Benoit to speak for Benoit to have the floor 
Uh, Benoit Marshall has a master degree in IT from the University of Compiègne, France, and has worked more than 25 years well, <laughs> for the digitalization of the clinical trial process for startups and world-leading medical device and pharmaceutical companies. And he is the founder of the not-for-profit Pickups Association, which stands for Patient in Control, Anonymity, Privacy Secured. And Benoit intends to bring uh, um, a solution to the health data access versus data privacy challenge like the European health data space. So we are looking forward to hearing your remarks. Thanks. Thank you. As we saw from the presentation before, opt-out is great, but there is some, maybe some improvement needed. And it's very nice. And we have discussion already with Nicola how we could improve it for UK, but also for Europe. And especially if Europe is starting from zero, so it's maybe a good time to think about what could be the, the solution. So, so if you want to see, you know, um, uh, find a middle ground, good for everybody, you have to look at both sides of the, of the game. So you have, the, of course, the privacy concerns, we all share here, but you have also the industry concern and the researcher concerns, which include patient association as well. So they actually publish a, a statement, a joint statement on, on the opt-out. Honestly, they're not favoring opt-out, they're not favoring even less opt-in. So, and it's interesting to see what are their concerns. So, the, the concerns is actually, it will be difficult, it's already difficult to get data and for some rare disease, also from some minorities. They're afraid that if you ask patients, then they will be, the data set will be very minimum and it will be uh, so small they could not do research. Also, they're afraid that some groups will by, for whatever reason, they will not participate, while others, <clears throat> so you will have a bias, bias in your data, and that could bring a problem in your research. Uh, the second concern is um, uh, about willingness to share, so some, again, some groups, some healthy people don't, are not really willing to share. So actually, when you get sick, you tend to, 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 to be willing to share, but if you help, rather healthy, it's not uh, the case. So the first one, uh, I would rather strongly disagree. <laughs> I have experience in clinical trial, and indeed, uh, the participation in clinical trials is heavily biased. I mean, in the US particularly, the, the minorities actually are not willing to participate to clinical trial. It's a, a well-known problem that the FDA is trying to deal. But if you ask, actually, why actually some minorities in the US are not willing to participate to clinical trial, I, I, I have my own opinion, but it might have to be politically uh, correct. I, I use ChatGPT, so I asked ChatGPT why in the US uh, some minorities are not willing to participate to clinical trial. The number one, there are several reasons to it, right? But the number one reason, it goes back to history. So in the early, in 1930 to 1972, they did some uh, clinical trials with some uh, minorities, actually Africa, uh, um, uh, people from African origin, in US on syphilis. They do it in a completely not ethical way. They didn't inform the people it was experimental drugs. They didn't inform them about the risk. Actually, when better drugs came afterward, they, they, they didn't apply those drugs. It was a perfect example for the non-ethical clinical trial. Following these scandals, actually, the IRBs has been born in the US to clear, to, because you say that you can't trust researchers to make things ethical. You need somebody neutral, like ethical bodies and things like this. So, but as a consequence, two generations later, I mean, black people in the US are still reluctant to participate to clinical trials. They still remember two generations later, and this is still a problem. So, the conclusion to it is you need to have trust. If you want those minorities to participate, you need to improve trust. And trust, you get it through transparency, being very honest, not by hiding things. So, this idea that, okay, it will be difficult to get the consent of people, let not them ask them, let's take the data, is to me not a good approach, right? When it comes to the second one, yes, I completely agree with it, and this is a solution we need to work on. So if you are very healthy, let's say you're under 30 and between 30 and 39, right? So you, uh, you actually have a good job, you actually plan to buy a house for your family, 
And you have to be careful with your privacy of your data because uh, if it gets known, you might have a problem to get a loan, you might lose your job as well. But if you are in your 60s, 70s, and you have cancer, and you have just one year to, to live, well, most likely you're more willing to share your data. You say, if it doesn't help me, it will help others, so I'm happy to help, right? So if you can have a direct correlation between the disease progression and the willingness to share data, you may say as a researcher, oh, you know what, I'm not doing research on healthy people, so who cares, right? But the problem is, uh, that if you opt out when you are in the 30, 39, most likely, when your rise is still healthy, most likely you will not change your mind later on. So when you, you're, unfortunately, your disease progress, uh, you will still have opt out. You probably will not go back and change your decision. And this, this is a problem, right? So, um, we saw okay, before is the same slides, of course, the same data. <laughs> so, we have a problem of building up, right? So, the problem is people opting out for whatever reason, because they, they, they're still healthy somehow, but they don't come back. So, it's only go up, it never go down. And like you say, if it's 5% today. If it's 10%, 20%. 20%, probably the data is already not so useful because probably the 20% are the most interesting uh, type of people. So for research, 20% of opt-out, we can throw away the data, most likely. Most likely. The other problem, it's actually for me uh, an important one. No one is talking about it. So let's say that 99% of the people that will use the data will do it in, in the, for the common good, for the common interest, right? But of course, you will have some black sheep as well. So there will be some evil use of the data. And we saw you know, the regulation, but will they be follow it? I don't know. Uh, the problem is that uh, most likely, most people will not know about this evil usage. But sometimes, it will hit the media. Okay? It will hit the media, and then the people will be really upset. And if we just give them one way to get opposed to it, which is a general opt-out, yeah. The problem is that everybody will be impacted. Also, the researchers that do do it everything in an ethical way, and that's completely unfair. So, so only the people doing non-ethical use should be impacted, not the ones that do it in an ethical way. This is a, a problem as well. So, um, let's think about you know all the different type of content and see how we do it. I mean, EHDS probably we will have all those type of consent. So if you talk about opt-in, which is explicit consent from the patient, you have a bit two types. Basically, you have your general consent. This is a model in Switzerland, by the way, I live in Switzerland. Basically, when you're really sick at the hospital, they ask you to sign a form that you give your data for the rest of your life for whatever research, right? Um, I know some Friends who we were patients, they didn't even know they signed it, that form, so it's not also the most ethical way. To me, a more ethical way is more like, the, and it's like, a, I would personally never sign it, it's like a blank check, right? Uh, I would say personally, yeah, if you want my data, come to me and tell me why you want to use the data. So it's more like an explicit consent, like you have in clinical trials. Uh, but the problem is a bit the logistical nightmares, you know, asking this and the fear that a lot of people will not even reply probably. So this is why the opt-out is coming out. If you don't care, you know, we just use your data. And again, you can have two categories. You have the general opt-out, as we saw with like in UK and maybe like EHGS will introduce. But you have something that no one is talking about, which for me would be very interesting. It would be what I call it a project-specific opt-out. So there's a correlation to the, to the specific consent info opt-in. So basically, you inform the patient about the project. You say, we have this interesting research, and this is going to benefit society. Are you willing to share your data? And if the patient doesn't reply, he doesn't care, we take the data, OK? And to me, this is probably the most elegant one. And let's move it on this one. Is it the best potential? Yeah, let's study it. So, if we compare like a project specific opt-in versus project specific opt-out, so assuming that 50% of the people when you ask, when you propose a project, you say, would you be willing to share? Let's say 50% probably will not even read the email, they will destroy it, right? 
So, and out of the people that will reply, 50% will say no, okay? In the case of an opt-in, you can only use 25% of the data. This is not enough. You lose a lot of data. This is what the researchers are afraid of, right? And if you go for an opt-out model, so if 50% of the people do not care, you know, they don't want to even read the things, then we'll use the data and only 50% say no, then you can use 75% of that. That's becoming much more interesting for research. And actually, there are some techniques, and I think the next talks about pet privacy enhancing technology. I mean, you could actually even get 100% using synthetic data. That would be an approach as well. Um, so if you use project-specific opt-out, the really good things is you don't have this build-up uh, problem we discussed before. So you ask the patient, are you willing to share your data for this specific project? They don't reply, they don't care. Uh, uh, so actually, it doesn't prevent you from going there again and ask, are you willing to share your data for this new research? And again, asking until maybe the times they say, hey, enough, don't ask me, don't spam me, you know, I, I don't want to share my data ever, you know, then we go to more general opt-out. But you can still try it, try it again. You don't have this opt-out problem, right? But the other benefit as well is, suppose you, you go to somebody and you say, I have this interesting research, are you willing to share your data? And the person don't reply or say no. Okay, well, uh, or just say no. You can still reach to the patient afterward to say, okay, we respected your will, we didn't take your data, but with the data of the one that shared the data, we could find such a discovery. It has been very useful and this and that, right? And I would be surprised, it would be very interesting research to measure, you know, how many, the next time you ask, how many of them will actually say yes? I think when you know that it's been used, then, then probably you will be more willing to share. Thank you. Yeah. But most likely we'll say, hey, wait a minute, uh, this, is, this is actually a lot of work to read all these research statements, so I don't have time to do it. And, and I told you yes twice, don't, don't bother me all the time, it's yes, okay? So you, you might want to define your preference, but you should not be preference just yes or no. It could be much more granular than that. Maybe you'd say, I'm supportive of all the research for cancer, but not for diabetes or whatever. Or I'm very supportive of all public research, but not private research. Okay, or you could say, oh, that company here, they, on the news, they did something nasty with patient data. I really want to boycott that company here. So you could actually define preference, and you could define preference like in a very granular way, and you could say either it's a yes, it's a no, or just ask me. That would be a good way as well. And then when you get the research, we need to a go up. Of, um, yeah, a okay. minute left. <laughs> yes. Let's Thank go you. up. And you, from a research, you would know immediately who is yes, who is no, and how many, or you could ask some patient as well. And that for me would be a very good solution for this problem of general opt-out. So basically, if one day one company is doing something wrong with the data, you could actually say, hey, you can just press this button and you will boycott that specific company. So all the good guys that do good research, they will not be impacted. That's the whole idea. Uh, so that's a bit the dream, the vision. So it's coming from UK as well. So it's one patient say, I'm willing to share my data. I definitely want to do, have it, but I want to see which research is it. And, and I want to be, yeah, I want to know what, what is it used for and things like this. And as long as you don't tell me this, I will opt out. But if you tell, give me all this, I will, I will give my data voluntarily. And finally, this is a last slide, move on. So this is a bit uh, the, the vision I see. So basically make it a, a risk base because every research is not the same. And EHDS actually has seen that. They say that for high risk uh, research, like with genetics, it should be an explicit concern. And I fully agree with that. So this is the left side. You could start actually with a project specific or opt-in and maybe at one point of time you say, okay, don't ask me all the time. You know, I make a general consent. Later, I think for standard risk, so normal kind of risk, so you could reach to the patient, it could be a project-specific opt-out. When the patient have enough to reply to all those questions, they could define their preference, they're not bothered so much. And finally, for the raw risk, maybe that's a majority of research. By low risk, I mean that even if the data is re-identified, it's not a big risk for the patient. So, you know, if, if they just have uh, the fact that you're smoking and you're a bit overweight and you have a bit of diabetes, I mean, who cares? Everybody has that, right? 
so even if you identify that it's not a big risk for you, I would call it raw risk, you should not even try to bother people with that one. A solution could be that you actually uh, go to, to, you publish on each hospital all the risks of research that are taking place and you could say, okay, for that research, we took the data from this of 100 patients in this hospital. And if anyone is not happy with that they take the data, you could actually register in the system so that next time we ask them actually, and they could define their preference for the next time. So that's the solution we think. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benoit, for bringing those interesting remarks on the possible uh, ideas, solutions, and also the technical aspects, and as well some uh, thought-provoking, uh, I think, uh, ideas for the discussions later on. Um, you also mentioned some uh, uh, minor um, aspects concerning, which is an important one, concerning, uh, for example, underrepresentation in healthcare. Uh, this uh, was a topic that uh, um, the speaker, uh, Elisa Leila El Hajj, would have brought today, but unfortunately she, she couldn't join us. And uh, therefore, also to manage the expectation of the audience, those parts, unfortunately, we had to mostly uh, focus on opt-in because of the slight change in, uh, in the panel. So I think it's, it's fair also to report on, on, on this <laughs> aspect of why we chose to focus most today on opt-in, opt-out. Um, but another thing that we wanted to discuss today it uh, was adopting a critical perspective on European and data space. So we are coming back from our journey on uh, the European and data space, uh, having regard what has happened in England and all the technical and patient perspectives. And we have seen all the theoretical uh, things that it could bring, but what's happening actually? What are the discussion? Is it uh, maybe a little bit overambitious? Is it gonna happen? Uh, we have talked about opt-in, opt-out, but what about opt-in? And there have been uh, in the European uh, um, field some discussions, some report brought by civil society. I'd love also to signal Edri's position paper, for example, that was released, uh, I think, around one year today, um, or more recently, and also other civil society organizations, for example, BOC, would also uh, provide some reports and criticize the European data space. And uh, to bring some policy perspectives and also maybe institutional ones, um, we are very lucky to have today uh, Francesco Vogelizan, who he is the advisor on digital policy for the Greens EFA group in the European Parliament. And uh, he will bring us uh, perspectives on uh, um, the European health data space. So Francesco, I'm happy to give you the floor and hear your, your remarks and ideas. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, just a small clarification uh, about opt-out and opt-in. Um, in the discussions around the EHDS, uh, opt-in is understood as patients giving explicit consent for sharing data, whereas opt-out in, uh, instead uh, implies automatic transmission uh, of, uh, of data. So just like this clarification, because uh, they can be confused. Um, where do we stand? Uh, so we, after the Christmas break, I mean, we all came back and uh, we thought that, uh, uh, you know, find, finding a deal um, before the European elections would have been almost impossible. But it seems to be like great willingness, especially by the Belgian presidency to push for, uh, for, for this file, being the number one priority in uh, health policy. And uh, the Commission as well really wants to see this blueprint becoming uh, a reality uh, for the European data economy uh, to come. So uh, that being said, uh, we need to find an agreement. Uh, and if there is one, this needs to be done before the 7th of, uh, of March, which is quite of a very tight uh, timeline given that it took us more than a year in Parliament to finalise uh, a common position and for Council even more, given the uh, sensitivity of uh, this uh, dossier. Um, next week, by the way, we will have the first uh, political trilogue uh, discussing some issues related to, uh, to primary use. 
Um, but what are the focal points, or at least the most controversial points uh, of discussion uh, at the moment between Parliament and Council? Um, for sure, primary use and secondary use are the two main uh, uh, um, um, core points where there are also uh, different perspective, or perspectives on how to apply a potential opt-out and opt-in. And starting from primary use, um, the European Parliament position uh, is relatively strong, I would say. I've listed six main safeguards, so primary use is a situation where um, there is a direct relationship between patient and healthcare professionals, so for the provision of, uh, of care. Um, you, as a patient, according to the European Parliament report, will be able to restrict access of your data in an EHR system, so European health record, to a specific health professional or to restrict specific data categories to um, um, a specific healthcare professional. When you restrict such data, so there is a restriction, the restriction is not visible in cross-border settings. So uh, let's say that, I mean, I'm in Italian, and I was born in Italy, let's say that I go on holiday in Croatia, I get injured, I need to go to a doctor in Croatia. If I restrict my patient file in Italy, such restriction is also not visible uh, in, uh, in Croatia and, in, of course, in all the other uh, member states. Um, there is also um, um, an obligation, eventually, uh, to uh, oblige um, um, healthcare professionals to access the data which is strictly relevant for their profession. So, for instance, uh, a dentist should not have access, of course, to my psychological records or uh, other very sensible information. This, unfortunately, we cannot specify in European law. It needs to be done at member state level. So, member states will need to provide specific rules on which patient, sorry, which healthcare professional can access what data. Then, whenever your health record will be accessed, the European Parliament position provides also for a right to receive automatic notifications. So, and this can take place in, uh, in different settings. Could be, you know, a pop-up on your phone, could be an email. It's up to the patient to, to decide. But you will, of course, also have a right to disable those notifications. There will be a logged uh, 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 system which will take uh, um, um, uh, track of, keep track of any healthcare professional which has accessed your healthcare file. And finally, perhaps the most important safeguard which was included uh, in, uh, in, in, in the plenary session of uh, December, namely Amendment 555, allows for a right to object registration of your electronic health data uh, in a so-called electronic health record system. This amendment came strongly from the uh, German doctors community. Uh, and it's uh, one of the main points, actually, which underpins the current coalition agreement uh, uh, in Germany. And this amendment basically does not stipulate an obligation for health data to remain on paper. So the digitalization of data is already present. What it does is that the moment you register your data in a doctor's file, you should then have a right to object your file to be stored in a centralized and interconnected uh, health storage, which will then be made available uh, for uh, secondary use. Council instead, uh, as it uh, uh, happens uh, most of the time, uh, provides uh, less rights. Uh, of course, there is uh, the keep, uh, you know, a prohibition to make certain no cross, uh, to, to, uh, to make um, restrictions not visible in cross-border setting. There is a right to restrict access, but only to specific healthcare professionals. And there is uh, a right to object access. But of course, um, uh, a right to object registration is not present. When it comes to secondary use, um, there are even more safeguards, I would argue, in the European Parliament position. Um, in the European Parliament position, there is a stratified approach, meaning a mixed approach between opt-out and opt-in. Uh, an opt-in, so where your, your data could, can be shared only with your explicit consent. Uh, this is the case for three main categories of data, which we believe to be extremely sensitive, sensitive sorry, and not potentially, um, that, and that could not be anonymized. And these are data coming from um, uh, biobanks, genomic and genetic data, and data 
from wellness uh, applications, which, by the way, are in the scope of the regulation. For those systems, you need to give your consent if you want this data to be used for secondary use, meaning for purposes other than the direct provision of healthcare. This could be research, innovation activities, telemedicine, training and testing of algorithms, and there is a, a huge list in Article 34. All the other data categories, they are subject to an opt-out. So transmission is automatic, but you can exercise, of course, your right to consent by actively taking place. How does this take place? We didn't specify it, uh, because uh, we cannot interfere on how member states exercise this right. So some member states might be able to do that at the healthcare uh, practitioner level. So you go to your doctor and you say, hey, doctor, I don't want this and this and this data to be shared for secondary use. Or you actually have to go to uh, a health data access body, so this new so-called gatekeeper at member state level, which will administer data for uh, secondary use. So it will very much depend from country to country. There are, of course, important repercussions because we need to think, for instance, about elderly people or people coming from disadvantaged backgrounds, how they can actually exercise this right. Um, but um, at the end, it will be a member state's choice for now to implement this uh, in practice. Council, of course, does not have anything on opt-out and opt-in. So there is simply automatic transmission, and you cannot refuse such automatic transmission. However, they provide for a right to object, according to GDPR. But such right to object can only be given where the member states decide to grant such a right to object to, uh, to its citizens. And of course, a right to object can be overridden for reasons of uh, public interest and uh, for, uh, uh, in the area of, of public and occupational health. So uh, it, it will, again, once again, be uh, contextual. So overall, uh, where do we stand? Uh, it's very hard to say. Uh, it's also very hard to say which will be the agreement, uh, if there is going to be an agreement by uh, 7 March. Uh, my perspective is that this file is very much based on the principle of subsidiarity. It's very hard to draw a line between what you can do at European level in terms of regulating data and how member states can actually decide on how to arrange and implement their healthcare systems. For sure, at least it is for me the main danger, is that we will not have a European health data space, but 27 national health data spaces, which will allow for a certain degree of data connection and interconnection, but of course also having 27 different data spaces means that you will have 27 different rights in relation to your primary use and secondary use of electronic health data. And uh, if the European health data space is to become a blueprint for the European data economy, because the Commission actually announced initially nine more data spaces, if I'm not mistaken, there are certain questions to be asked about to what extent this vision is potentially possible and how you as a citizen can exercise your rights in cross-border settings, at least for your health data. Uh, yeah, I, I, I guess that's it. Um, uh, if you have any questions, of course, uh, please repeat to jump in. Thank you very much, Francesco, for bringing us your perspective uh, today. Um, so, I have a lot of questions, but I, I think that many others do as well, and uh, in the interest of time, I think we could start with questions right away. Uh, they told me that we have an initial 10 minutes because the panel started uh, a little bit uh, later, so don't be shy, <laughs> and if you want uh, to ask questions, please. Okay. I will. And uh, and please, please know that you are live, uh, live streamed as well, so just to be mindful of that. That's it. fine. Uh, my name is Ine van Zeeland. I am a PhD researcher here at the VUB. And I would uh, think, I would like to start by pointing out the obvious, that people who are patients are people who are ill. And so valid consent in that consent or in that context or explicit consent um, you know, means a completely different thing. It will just not be possible for many people who are ill to 
you know, inform themselves properly, etc. But I'm actually more concerned about the ethical consequences of then just assuming or having an opt-out regime and where you just assume that people who are not responding are okay with everything. I mean, that's just probably not reality of people who are very ill. They just have other things on their minds. So I'd like to give that one back to you. Thank you. Is there anyone that wants to add any remark? Um, yeah, I, I know what you're saying. And I think it's a really tricky one because trying to get everyone in your country to consider the matter enough and make an informed decision to opt in would be really difficult. But perhaps it's like ethically the best thing to do. But I guess if you're coming at it from the, the government perspective or something, is that actually feasible? Is it practical to do that? And we see a lot of opt-out systems used uh, in other things like organ donation, for example. Um, not that that's perfect either, but uh, I think it's kind of the model that lots of countries across the world have kind of adopted as the most straightforward on the basis that people who are probably most against it will find the way to opt out and will be happy with it. Um, but it does mean that there's a large group of people that where we don't really know and we just assume that because they haven't said no, it's okay. Um, and maybe that's, I don't know, in England that that's going to be part of that kind of national public deliberation about what what's the best way of doing this because we also know that if we ask everyone every time we want to use their data that's, that's not a practical way of doing things just uh, maybe i say for, for the first one so if you're really sick i mean it's you think about everything, but maybe you don't want to read all these documents. But I have experience with clinical trials. I mean, it's not perfect, but it works. So explicit consent is a rule for clinical trials and patients are sick by definition. Uh, for, for we come to the second one, I agree with you that maybe some people would not know it and maybe it depends how much you advertise it. I mean, you could say that the idea I propose at the end would be to have a website and you could maybe advertise it at the entrance of the hospital, say, we are doing research to help patients and so on. Here's a list you can find on this website, the list of research we're doing. And if you not agree with that, you could register and, and get your opinion asked every time. Uh, I mean, I completely share your concern. Uh, it's, it's something that we tried to include actually uh, in the parliament proposal with our amendments, but there was no majority for it, unfortunately. Um, something that the HTS provides is, um, you know, to give your rights to an authorized representative eventually to uh, exercise your rights to uh, consent or other rights stemming from the regulation. Every access bodies will need to have support services for specific uh, population groups, especially vulnerable groups. But again, that depends on how that is done at member state level. And the opt-out danger is there, of course. It's, if I think about, you know, my, my grandparents, they don't even know how to open a website. How can they exempt themselves from data sharing? Will they be able to do that on paper? They, will they reply to a letter, to like a, a mail? Um, we don't know this. Um, it's a bit, uh, yeah, it's, there is a danger looming in there for sure that will need to be addressed at member state level. Uh, thank you very much. Just to complement, I, I as well completely share your concern. I've seen it a lot in my own empirical research with patients coming again and again. And I would like to give two examples that could be uh, interesting. On the one side, personally, I really see it more as an evolution to come. So we should be very strong if this is the implemented uh, solution on sensibilization campaigns and information and gathering and encouraging trust. And this is going to be realistic, I think, a fears to, to come. The example would be the Belgian Biobank law, which has, uh, similar to organ donation, opt out for residual use of samples and tissues. And the idea is that already at 18, you receive a letter and you know that this is going to happen. But this is really for the next generation to get used to that way of doing things. And the other for me that I think it's very interesting is in this idea of 
patient involvement, stakeholder representation in the decision making. Uh, we did a survey last year with patients where we had the example of data altruism, which I think is interesting in this context. Within data altruism, people give consent to data altruism organizations to collect their data and then further share. Uh, the data altruism organization itself deciding to whom to share the data for purpose of general interest. And uh, in our survey, we had this imaginary question, what if patient experts are involved in the decision making with whom you share the data? And we had a statistically significant change from being neutral in general to do it, to people being likely to do it as long as they are represented in these bodies. So maybe that's also something interesting to keep in mind in the discussions on the health data access bodies and going forward. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Biplav Gautam and I'm a student here at ULB. So my question is, would uh, something like proper transparency or granularity to the patient level such that uh, their data is being used for particular research and they can at any time have a look at what their data is being used and what is that research is properly uh, being done. Um, and, and they can be like go uh, at any any time, it was something like in Estonia. Uh, so we were there, and they had an e-government portal. And any time their data was accessed, they were notified, and also they could see who was accessing the data, why was it accessible. So, uh, having more granularity would help people uh, opt in by default or be more reasonable. What do you think about it? Thank you. Thanks a lot for the question. Uh, on the more granularity, I think this is also uh, important to keep in mind. The, I really like the example with the patient preferences. So that's something to, that Benoit brought to keep in mind as, as, as a solution. But also to keep, and this is coming from my own discussions and empirical research with patients, people indeed sometimes don't want to be reminded anymore. They don't want to be constantly uh, receiving this notification. I, it's really a bit, of a, a bit like a spectrum. I like to compare it. There are the very engaged ones that are OK to have this and the ones that are not okay to have this reminder again and again. So here I think the, the, the interesting solution is really this preference to be able to capture different, not only the, the granularity of options, but also the different types of individuals, the typology a little bit of the citizen in terms of their way to, to be engaged. Uh, I think from my perspective, having that information available is only a good thing. Um, Lots of people like different, we, we talk about like levels of information. So if you just want the very high level, being able to get that, but equally, if you want to be able to go into the detail, having that available somewhere is really helpful because it shows that, you know, nothing's hidden from you and therefore it like helps to build trust. Um, but I think it's, it's one thing and it's kind of difficult to do to like gather all of those projects that are using it. Um, but it's also a case of thinking along that whole life cycle, like who's involved in the, the, providing the platforms, like the digital platforms, who's, who's involved in providing analytical services. So in England, for example, um, we have private companies that provide the software for doctors. But lots of people don't know that. And when you explain, when you mention that to someone, they get very scared and surprised that that's the case. But it's been the case for decades. Um, and it, it's not really something that's problematic in the health kind of ecosystem. Um, but lots of members of the public don't even know that private companies are involved at that point, let alone like down here when the data is actually used for research. So it's a, it's a big public campaign about how we improve that whole journey. Completely agree on the granularity of the decision of the preference, but also on, on the need to inform the patient on what the data has been used for. This is the way to develop trust. And I remember he was at, uh, at a conference like this. He was uh, the mother of a rare disease patient. And she said, please stop telling me that the data is going to be useful. <coughs> Tell me how the data has been useful. It's a big difference between the two. Uh, thank you, Mariano, uh, Open Rights Group. So, uh, I mean, like, um, 
The conversation today focused a lot, as you said, on opt-in and opt-out. I'm a little concerned about this for a number of reasons. First of all, coming from the United Kingdom, which is a country where, uh, let's say, there is um, historically a very uh, high concerns about uh, uses of health data and also participation to uh, opt-out initiatives, the national, like uh, the mass uh, opt-out that happened uh, some years ago against um, uh, Cameron's initiative to share pa uh, patients' data. Uh, was uh, pretty substantial, you know, it led to the government fundamentally halting uh, uh, this data sharing initiative to millions of people to opt out and so forth. However, on the other hand, uh, what then happened is, you know, like the dust settled down, comes out that you actually need two kind of opt outs, one for the national healthcare service, the other one for your general practitioner, which is your family doctor fundamentally. Your family doctor, after a while, will send you an email, we updated our privacy policy, and you lose the opt-out. <laughs> and coming, you know, then we come to the federated data platform, the Palantir thing, where uh, you can't opt-out because fundamentally the, pa the platform uh, provides you direct care. So uh, direct care is not um, covered by opt-out because it's when you go to a doctor and you are asked for assistance. And finally, we come to the United Kingdom today, which is falling apart, uh, and uh, generally speaking, the issue of the men in the street is not really to manage their opt-out and opt-in preferences when it comes to health data. Uh, I mean, like uh, even being, you know, like a fan of uh, data rights uh, and generally speaking, giving more agency to the individual, I guess if this is the right approach to, uh, you know, fundamentally punish bad actors uh, when it comes to bad data uses. And here, you know, like uh, even from the prism of data rights, you know, like I can think of, um, for instance, when you think about consumer rights, we didn't approach, I don't know, like travel rights with the idea of, uh, well, you know, if something goes wrong, next time you choose a different provider and everything goes well. We, take, we gave people a right to compensation, a right to seek damages. How about, you know, like uh, we ask for rights to actually punish these companies and get our money back? One comment. Yeah, I, 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 my personal view would be indeed like to do a, like a, if you get a problem with travel, you would get an insurance and you will be reimbursed. In clinical trials, if anything goes wrong, uh, the, the sponsor takes an insurance and it will indemnize the, the victim. So I think we should have the same actually for real world data. So I think the sponsor, whoever makes research, should have an insurance. And, and if anything goes wrong with the privacy, then they should, the, the, the victim should be indemnized. And actually, I, I trust in the industry, I mean, the, the insurance company will weight the privacy risk and will put the premium for the insurance at such a level that will motivate people to work on privacy. Uh, I think that's a really good idea. I think at the moment, there's too many instances where either um, data protection law is broken and you probably don't hear about it, or the company has acted unethically or has not completely complied with um, the data sharing agreement or something like that. And even though in England some of those instances are public, there's not always a punishment for it. The Information Commissioner's Office get involved sometimes, and there might sometimes be fines. Um, but I think a lot of people feel like there isn't enough of a disincentive or like punishments that are out there for um, bad uses of data and the lack of kind of easy compensation or redress in some way. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for being here today, for the speakers for coming here today from different countries, for their time, for your time, your interests, your interactions, your questions. Thanks a lot of all for those who are joining online and who are watching maybe in a couple of days. <laughs> thank you so much. I wish you a nice continuation, nice discussion during the whole day.